Each year, as part of homecoming, we welcome back an honored alum. We do that to celebrate their accomplishments and to have part of homecoming focus upon what an academic experience at BYU means. We are pleased to have as our honored alumnus for 2007, Judge Lynn W. Davis. He has ties to this college in several ways. He received his bachelor's degree in sociology from BYU in 1971. He served on the School of Social Work Advisory Board from 1998 to 2004. He and his wife Lenore are the parents of five children and proud grandparents of twin girls. Of his own experiences at BYU, he says, quote, BYU engendered an inner desire to excel professionally and left me with the highest expectation of analytical thinking and scholarship. Equally important, he continues, I was taught to always leave room for intuitive insights, ever exploring harmony of heart and the sacred dimension of life's pilgrimage, close quote. Judge Davis has been a trial court judge for over 20 years. He was appointed to Utah's fourth district court in June of 1992 by Governor Norman H. Bangader. Prior to his appointment, he served as a deputy county attorney and also worked in private practice for several years. Along the way, he's been adjunct faculty at the J. Reuben Clark Law School, teaching in the criminal trial practice program and serving as director of the Trial Advocacy Program. Judge Davis has published numerous papers and articles for prestigious law reviews and law journals across the country. Many of his publications reflect his passion for equal access to the courts for minorities. Judge Davis holds the record for presiding at more adoptions than any other judge in the history of the state of Utah and has performed hundreds of marriage ceremonies in Spanish. Brother Davis is the young man's president in his ward. He has served as a bishop, bishop's counselor, high counselor, and a counselor in his stake presidency. In fact, it was when he was serving as a bishop's counselor in a singles ward that he met his sweet wife. For his commitment to community, church, and professional life, our college is pleased to recognize as a distinguished alumnus Judge Lynn W. Davis. He has titled his remarks today, Reflections from the Bench, Lessons of Humanity. Please join me in welcoming Judge Davis back to BYU. I feel like I've just come from a prom or something. They put the, <laughs> the corsage on me. It's wonderful to be here. I didn't know whether anyone would come. I, I, I did invite some neighbors. And um, I told them there would be door prizes. So, they, <laughs> so they're here. Um, but what a treat it is to, uh, to be here. Dean Magleby and faculty and friends and distinguished guests, I'm humbled. Uh, by this honor. In large measure, it is attributable not to me individually, but to the uh, Utah judiciary. I am profoundly aware that one of the reasons I am here is to serve as a living exhibit that people do graduate and get jobs. <laughs> Upon my graduation, uh, I moved out into the real world. I moved to Orem, Utah. <laughs> At this time, I wish to also take a moment to honor you and this university. Several years ago, I hosted a group of judges from Mozambique and Tanzania, Romia, Slovenia, and Israel. The Supreme Court Justice from Israel had had substantial contact with BYU students in the kibbutzes when he was younger. By virtue of that positive contact and his witness of your standards and of excellence, he was absolutely surprised that we had any crime whatsoever in Provo, Utah. That's a profound legacy and a tribute to you. Thank you collectively for the contributions you are making uh, in this world. 
The most important fact or accomplishment recited by Dean Magleby relates to my marriage to my lovely wife, Lenore. 30 years ago this month, I met the lovely Lenore, and my heart has never been the same. Let me give you a little background that is not contained uh, within my introduction or my resume. I was raised in Riverside, California, in a middle class, very blue collar, Caucasian neighborhood. An African American family moved in a couple of blocks away from our home, and all my friends and their families sold and fled. Eventually, we were the only white family that remained. There were a few Latino families, but the rest were black. My parents' decision to stay proved to be life-changing for me and sparked my interest in civil rights and a career passion for equal access to the courts for minorities, particularly linguistic minorities. On the last pages of the novel, The Brothers Karamazov, Alyosha says, quote, you must know that there's nothing higher and stronger and more wholesome and good for life in the future than some good memory, especially a memory of childhood, of home. People talk to you a great deal about your education, but some good sacred memory preserved from childhood is perhaps the best education. Fifty years ago, I gave my first public speech. I chose to speak on the Dead Sea Scrolls. I do not know what possessed a 10-year-old boy to speak on such an esoteric and didactic subject. I was nervous, I became flustered and tongue-tied, and I announced I would speak on the Dead Sea Squirrels. <laughs> My brother and friends were on the front row. They were not charitable in their assessment and delight and in their amusement. I am not sure that I have fully recovered from that experience, and I think about it every time I speak in public. <coughs> Allow me to finally get to my topic. I thought initially that I might speak about preserving an independent judiciary, and then I thought I would th speak about trends in therapeutic justice, drug courts, mental health courts. I finally uh, selected a title to my speech, decided to lecture on reflections from the bench. But I realized that my neighbors, Pro Professor Nelson and Professor Selfridge, would not be charitable. They would ask, why at a time of distinction and honor would you ever want to talk about your athletic career? <laughs> You've got to know my friends. <laughs> Accordingly, I added the subtitle, Reflections from the Bench, Lessons of Humanity. With that introduction, I wish to share stories. They're jurisprudential vignettes, snapshots of time, in large measure that have captured no media attention, but need to be told. In many jurisdictions across this country, those called a jury service simply refuse to appear. The delinquency rate is frequently 50%. I wish to contrast that with failure with a tender letter that I received from a prospective juror. In a very, very unsteady hand, she wrote, quote, I am 80 years old, born January 15, 1910, I am crippled with arthritis and plebitis. I have had a hip replacement. I am on crutches. But if I can help, I am willing to try. I sometimes need help getting out of chairs. Sometimes we receive a call from a prospective juror who believes because of station in life that jury service is below him. It would be a tremendously demeaning bother. He reasons that he is extraordinary in some capacity and is entitled to exemption. When that happens, I reflect upon this common widow and recall an observation made by Ken Shelton in his book Beyond Counterfeit Leadership when he said, 
and observed, they may have no face, no name, or place in history. But indeed, the least, the last, the weakest, the dumbest, the plainest, the most efficient, disfigured, despised, may be counted among the best and the first and the greatest as the tables turn in light of true judgment. I am crippled with arthritis and plebitis, a hip replacement, and I'm on crutches. But if I can help, I am willing to try. This glimpse of greatness is a story that must be told. Adoptions are the most heartwarming and touching of all judicial experiences. There's always a, a remarkable story behind each and every placement. From time to time, I preside at adoptions that are unique and very compelling. Mark and Nadine Evans were empty nesters. Both were working. They had time and energy and a very, very comfortable life. They were, in contemporary terms, living the good life. But they were impressed to adopt three children from an orphanage in the Ukraine. Two boys, though not biologically related, were like brothers. They bonded because they both had cleft palates. The Cardin family saw a need and adopted four boys from Ethiop an Ethiopian orphanage. There were two sets of brothers. The Christensen family, who already had seven or eight children, adopted a small African-American girl suffering from a host of severe and life-threatening physical ailments, including malformed brain, blindness, mild cerebral palsy, and hypothalamus. The adopting mother had seen this child in a dream, struggling up their family tree. The Watcott family adopted six children from Africa. The Evans family recently, two and a half weeks ago, adopted a very premature baby who at birth weighed less than one pound. I am convinced that absent their vigilance and love and prayers and caring during the long stay at the neonatal intensive care unit, this beautiful girl would have died. She now joins a happy, remarkable family of 14. Sometimes there is a fine line between sainthood and insanity. <laughs> I always acknowledge uh, the, birth, the absent uh, birth mothers at adoption. <clears throat> In an abortion-filled world, they could have made other choices. I always quote from Mother Teresa of Calcutta who said, it is a very great poverty to decide that a child must die so that you may live as you wish. These are stories that must be told. There must be a very special place in heaven for these adopting couples. I saw this very child in a dream, struggling to climb up our family tree. You need to know, and I know that I'm in a fairly partisan crowd, that at every adoption, while the parents are under oath, I ask whether or not this child, this treasured, tender, innocent, beautiful young child, will be raised as a BYU fan. <laughs> I think I have a duty as a judge to make sure that they are not raised by infidels <laughs> and heathens and heretics. For over 20 years, I've sat as a judge in the community. It's an absolute wonderful privilege and honor. What a remarkable journey it has been. And we have other judges present here today. Some time ago, after an oriental dinner, my lovely wife and I shared fortune cookies. Mine said, you could be a huge success in the entertainment field. <laughs> I was deeply shocked and appalled that I had evidently chosen the wrong profession. <laughs> Daily I attend to all sorts of disintegrative matters and forces in our community. Drugs and theft and robbery and child abuse and rape and homicides and together with other crimes of violence in our society. I witness the devastating and destructive results of crime and the heartbreak and shattered dreams of innocent victims. 
I deal with individuals who jettison time-honored and time-tested values in exchange for quick financial gain or instant gratification, whose lives are filled with compromise and personal infidelity of heart, this plethora of human ills can be downright disheart disheartening. What to do? When assigned to the domestic civil division, I sign literally hundreds of divorces in a calendar year. While signing decrees of adoption brings unequal joy, in stark contrast, I always sign divorce decrees with a sense of reservation and a modicum of sadness. It is heartbreaking to watch the fabric of the American family coming unraveled and disintegrating. In a society where the virtues of marriage seem to be under attack, we are presented with a constant barrage of divorces. We live in a day of political and marital and philosophical and personal infidelity. Couples come before me intoxicated with societal indoctrination, harboring the belief that divorce is the ultimate problem solver. That's a baseless fabrication and a pervasive prevarication. While I do not pretend to have the answers to complex long-term relationship challenges, it is my professional and personal observation that divorce is not the cure-all panacea. I cannot look to academia for support. The academic denigration of marriage and the attack on the sanctity of marriage has severe consequences and a very costly remedy. I must look to committed couples within the community as mentors who nurture and heal relationships and dispel the narcissistic myths engendered by society. I counter this barrage of incivility by the following. I choose a family each month to honor and to thank. Some recipients are neighbors or friends for whom I have deep respect and admiration, but most are perfect strangers whom I have read about performing service or accomplishing something positive in our community. At the end of a week filled figuratively with Henry VIII's and Anne Boleyn's, I send a letter to a couple celebrating a golden wedding anniversary. In my estimation, headlines should be filled with stories about lives filled with commitment and trust, fidelity and faith through lean and fruitful years. These are the stories that must be told. We desperately need marriage mentors in our families and in our society. They are the true heroines and the heroes, and it is there we find the genesis of greatness. This next little section I've actually titled Chronicles of Faith, Chronicles of Courage, Chronicles of Forgiveness. Recently our nation has witnessed the unique quality of forgiveness evidenced in the Amish community when facing the murder of innocents. But that forgiveness is not unique to that Amish community. Beautiful examples abound in our communities even under the most dire of circumstances. I wish to share a tragic but triumphant and amazing victim story from Utah, from my court, that has changed my life and touched the lives of so many others. It is a chronicle of faith, a chronicle of courage, a chronicle of forgiveness. On February 2, 2004, Kent Griffith of Pleasant Grove, Utah, was murdered. He was killed while saving the life of a co-worker who had fallen as they were fleeing a gunman. He returned to help this co-worker and was killed while assisting her. He died a hero. Kent Griffith was a youth leader, a coach, active in his church, and had been married for 14 years to a wonderful wife, Melissa. At the time of his death, he left four young children, Brittany, age 11, Taylor, age 9, Austin, age 7, and Houston, age 1 and a half. The loss to Kent Griffith's family, both immediate and extended, was almost immeasurable. On May 19, 2005, I conducted a sentencing hearing on the aggravated capital murder charge. 
The courtroom was packed with family from both sides and with the media. But this sentencing hearing was different from any that I had ever conducted in my 20 years on the bench. Allow me to draw verbatim for the record. Melissa, the young widow, spoke first. Among other things, she shared, quote, I want the defendant and his family to know that I am not bitter towards them. I know that he acted alone and it's not his family. I want them to have full faith and comfort in knowing that we hold no ill will towards them. We forgive them for this. Mr. Griffith's father then addressed the court, quote, I would also like to say to his family that our tears and our hearts have gone out for them. And we would like to offer them, my daughter-in-law and our family, if they would like, we would like to sit down and visit with them and let them know that we really do care. Melissa's father next addressed the court. Among other things, he shared the following. My heart aches. My faith is such what's left to me, and I believe my family members, and it's been expressed by them. What is left to me is to forgive him. Brittany, the oldest daughter, courageously shared her love for her father with such deep emotion and tears that the court reporter, who was attempting to make a verbatim transcript, struggled. But we all understood the language of the heart. Melissa Griffith's uh, sister shared the following insights. Melissa, about an hour and a half after the murder, gathered her family and extended family around her. With incredible composure, she said, as hard as it is for us, can you imagine how difficult it is for the perpetrator's family right now? Wow, is that amazing? And she cried for them. She strictly instructed them not to talk to the press. She resisted the temptation to call attention to her own plight. If it could potentially harm or deepen the pain and suffering of the perpetrator's family. Next, defense counsel observed, Judge, this is for me, it's been a very unusual hearing. I've been practicing law for 30 years now in numerous sentencing hearings where victims come in to testify about the effects they have had that the defendant's actions have caused. And I do not recall a hearing where a family like the Griffiths came in and unanimously offered their forgiveness to the defendant. It's understandable to see people being angry and upset, but the ability to forgive is, in this case, is something rare and something they really need to be commended on. It was then the court's turn to carefully weigh mitigating and aggravating circumstances and pursuant to law, pronounce judgment. I also made some observations regarding this unique sentencing hearing. Let me quote myself. This is a terrifying and traumatic event. It's a crime against humanity. It involves an unthinkable act of violence against an innocent man. For both families, the crime has left a trail of tears, a trail of devastation and shattered dreams and heartbroken innocent victims. For Kent Griffith, we will miss the contributions and gifts and the immeasurable good that he has done in our community. Now those gifts are memories. But memories still teach and lift and leaven and inspire and motivate. Certainly nothing this court can do will heal the hurt to nurture the fatherless tender, tender children, Brittany and Taylor and Austin and Houston, or make a widow whole. I leave that task to generous and supporting friends and family and neighbors. And ultimately, as has been mentioned here on both sides, to a loving God who is the great healer, the quintessential ultimate reconciler. Years ago, I became acquainted with a woman whose loving husband was killed by a drunk driver. At the time, he was serving as a bishop, as I recall. 
She raised her young family in large measure alone. She taught her children never ever to hate the perpetrator. She recognized that bitterness can become an all-consuming, a, a kind of cancer to the soul, a voracious and unchecked cancer which can and will destroy hope and joy and light and love. It can destroy vision. It can become numbing. It can atrophy the heart. That the task of forgiveness is long and arduous is an understatement. I went on. I have witnessed both extremes. I have witnessed victims who harbor such ill will and bitterness that it consumes their entire lives. Not infrequently, I have victims who want the perpetrator to be drawn and quartered and eviscerated in, in the public square. They're consumed with bitterness. I don't find that, all, that at all to be the case here with the Griffith family and extended family. Hearts were not created to harbor hatred and bitterness. Hearts even faced with bru the brutal reality of an aggravated murder someday must brim with hope. My voice cannot find adequate expression of compassion for the victim's family as they navigate these difficult times. Likewise, I cannot articulate an expression of compassion to the extended family of the perpetrator. That must be an incredible burden. As I mentioned at the outset, this incident has left a trail of tears and a trail of devastation on both families. I received a letter this week. I'm still quoting from the sentencing record. From Taylor, the 10-year-old daughter of the victim. It's handwritten. Here it is. Dear Judge, I just want you to know that I don't want Daryl, that's the defendant, to die or anything because it would just hurt everyone even more. From Taylor Griffith. This is a priceless handwritten, handwritten letter from a 10-year-old fatherless child. So as my life experience on the bench has encompassed some 20 years, I'm not sure I'd ever seen a circumstance where there has been such an expression on the part of the victim's family for the perpetrator and the perpetrator's family. Never have I seen that. Young Taylor has learned something that it takes a lifetime to learn. A local author may have said it best, a BYU professor, Dennis Rasmussen, who said, evil multiplies by the response it seeks to provoke. And when we return evil for evil, we engender corruption ourselves. The chain of evil is broken for good when a pure and loving heart absorbs a hurt and forbears to hurt in return. Well, that's the lesson that little Taylor reemphasized in that tender letter where she harbors no ill will. We all experienced a Pauline-type conversion, a jurisprudential epiphany about forgiveness from a common widow and a 10-year-old primary-aged unlettered child. It was unprecedented. There was no dry eye to be found. The mother, widow, and fatherless children from the outset had made a final, irreversible decision to forgive from which they would never, never retreat. Remarkably, under the intense, grueling burden of personal, unremitting grief and loss and anguish, anguish they chose forgiveness. The balm of Gilead. They refused to allow selfish clamor or media clamor to destroy their precious inner peace. They were resolute and unanimously loyal to their hearts. There was no ambivalence. Most striking of all, this remarkable quality of forgiveness harbored by the Griffith family appears to be intergenerational. Their decision to forgive was almost an automatic response 
to the inner moral imperative, to their deepest spiritual moorings, and to their religious heritage. I am convinced that the road of peace that the Griffiths have chosen will yet lead them buoyantly and triumphantly through future unsettled and stormy venues. Now let me conclude. If we look solely and exclusively and even primarily to persons of status or position or wealth or accomplishment to teach us, we will miss the many lessons of humanity. We must enlarge that myopic vision and view to include prophets as well as poets, the nameless and people of goodwill and deep insight, the widow and the unlettered child. That ought to be a ubiquitous and ever-present article of faith. While they may have no name or face or place in history, they will always have a place in our hearts. A contemporary author has pointed out that the poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow believed that the holiest of all holidays are not the ones are on our calendars, but the ones we observe in silence and apart. He called these special days our secret anniversaries of the heart. Sometimes we dismiss the tugs of remembrance as sentimental or unimportant. And I know the academics would claim that what I'm saying today is maudlin. But honoring the personal passages that alter the trajectory of our lives is how we grow and change and heal and find the strength to continue in our journey. On that journey, may it be our lot to look keenly and perceptively and deeply with open hearts for lessons of a humanity. Along that journey, in the words of our Old Testament friend Micah, May we do justly and love mercy and walk humbly. I am crippled with arthritis and phlebitis, a hip replacement, and am on crutches. But if I can help, I am willing to try. I saw this very child in a dream, struggling to climb up our family tree. Dear Judge, I don't want him to die or anything because it would just hurt everyone even more. You must know that there is nothing higher and stronger and more wholesome and good for life in the future than some good memory, especially a memory of childhood, of home. There are lessons of humanity that, these are the lessons of humanity that must be told. And I thank you for listening.